morning, 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 saints and friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Hastings Bible Fellowship. I'm Cookie and he's Mark Stokes. And you are you. And we welcome you to our teaching today. What are we going to be teaching on, husband? We're going to be in Matthew 22, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be finishing uh, Matthew 22 in terms of uh, what our Savior Jesus is uh, sharing with those that hate his guts, <laughs> the leadership in Jerusalem. Leadership in Jerusalem. And so, um, before we get into our teachings on Matthew 22... We are going to pray, and then we are going to enter into Matthew 22 and find out what the Lord is saying to those who have ears to hear spiritual things. So put your, turn your spiritual ears on, turn it up loud, because God's got good news for you. How about that? Amen. Pray Let's husband. Pray. Heavenly Father, today we're so thankful for your goodness and for your wonderful works to the children of men. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins according to the scriptures, who was buried and who rose again from the dead according to the scriptures, who ascended up on high as our high priest and king to thy throne, O God. And from there he is expecting till enemies are made his footstool. We seek you, Lord Jesus, today. Leading God us into your truth, for you are great, you are mighty, you are filled with wisdom. You are filled with glory, and you have poured out your glory on your yes. people. Thank you for it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank amen, God for it. Amen. All right. Now. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, we're going to get another one. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who had previously been invited to the wedding feast. But they refused to come. Why? They wouldn't believe on Jesus as the Messiah. This is the religious leaders. This, they, they didn't like the way the son looked. Yeah. They wanted a king mm -hmm. with an army, with an army mm -hmm. that would conquer the Roman government, right? That would uh, dispel the Roman government from having authority over all of us who are in GV. We wanted to uh, have uh, what the Roman government had, and so forth, of the rich leaders, right? and so therefore. They refused to accept and receive God's Messiah. Right. Verse 4. Then he sent out some other servants saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calves are butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Right, so the, the prophets kept saying, Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. Jesus is the anointed king. Come to the wedding. And what did they do? They paid no attention. They disregarded the invitation, treating it with contempt, and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. Mm -hmm. The rest of the invited guests seized his servants and mistreated them, insulting and humiliating them, and killed them. Now, why does God send prophets to uh, Israel? He sends them because Israel has been naughty. Trying to get them back in line. And so, therefore, the prophets say, yo, Israel, you need to repent mm -hmm. or be judged harshly by Almighty God. They didn't want to hear all of that. And so what did they do? They mistreated him and killed him. They had been doing These that people. for thousands of years. People are just wretched. Okay. So verse 7 says, the king was enraged. 
over all of that. And what did the king uh, do? Go. He sent his soldiers and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Stop. That's the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Not only in olden times, before Jesus came. After. But after Jesus came, you know, Jerusalem has been destroyed twice. But this one here uh, was um, describing the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Some people say 70 AD, you know, mm -hmm. after the death, you know, type so on. Uh, this is the year 2022. And so, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70, not only was the city of Jerusalem destroyed, but the temple of Herod was destroyed mm -hmm. as well. You go to Jerusalem today, there's not a, a physical brick and mortar temple there. Why? It's just a wall. It's just a wall that's been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is about in verse 7. Mm -hmm. All right, verse 8. When he said to his servants, then, then he, he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So go to the main highways that lead out of the city and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. All right, so this is a call to spread the message of redemption to the entire planet. We don't care who you, you are. are, male, female. You are privileged to hear and respond to the message of the kingdom of God. And the message of the kingdom of God is a message of repent and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's right. And if you believe on that message, believe it on him, you're going to be put in right relationship with God. You're going to receive God's free gift of righteousness. That's right. And so what are we going to do in verse 10? Those servants went out into the streets and gathered together all the people they could find, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests sitting at the banquet table. All right, now, so notice this maps to the dragnet in Matthew 13. It's only one dragnet. You know what fishermen do with dragnets? They throw that dragnet into the ocean sea mm -hmm. and they gather all kinds of fish, good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And then when they pull them ashore, they separate them. They separate. Who is that on the ball? Take it down. And when the king came in to see the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed appropriately in wedding clothes. And he said, Friend, how did you come in here without wearing the wedding clothes that were provided for you? Mm -hmm. And the man was speechless and without excuse. Mm -hmm. Then the king said to the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. In that place there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. And for many are called, invited, summoned, but few are chosen. And why was uh, he uh, tossed into the darkness outside? Because he didn't choose. He didn't have on the right clothes. He didn't choose. He did not choose Christ. That's why he was without excuse and speechless. He had the clothes to put on and didn't. Chose not to. 
In other words, there are people in the Miami who have been hearing, been hearing about God's righteousness for many, many years, including from this broadcast. Mm -hmm. You haven't responded to the claims of Christ in faith. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't you want to avoid being tossed into the garden? You do. You don't know you do. But trust me. You do. Yeah, you, 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 you. This verse 13. is a wake-up call for the world. Because the king has provided clothing for us. His name is Jesus. And so, if you've been provided clothing, mm -hmm. there's not going to be any excuse for you at the uh, time of this of wedding, this wedding. Dinner, feast, because the clothing has been provided. His name is Jesus. Now, of course, the King loves us so much. He never forces anyone to put their clothes on. No. He gives the clothes. It is up to you to repent and believe. Yeah. Now, next verse. When the Pharisees went. Now, no. verse 14. I, oh, when many are called, invited, summoned, the few are chosen. There you go. Yeah. Those that are chosen are those that put their wedding clothes on. on. So, the Lord Jesus is challenging us to put Christ on to repentance. Mm -hmm. All right, now you can go to verse 16. Then the Pharisees went and conspired together, plotting how to trap him by distorting what he said. Okay, stop. So, on this broadcast, <laughs> we've uh, gone through three parables. Parables that dated back to Matthew 21 as a result of the religious leaders challenging the authority of Jesus Christ. Right. Now, Jesus has already said, I'm not going to tell you where I got my authority from because you all have rejected me anyway. I'm going to take it upon myself to show you your true condition. So he gave these three parables here. Matthew 21, down to Matthew 22. Mm -hmm. So that the religious leader would see their true condition. And they saw their true condition. They saw that the, these parables were about them. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now you go to verse 15. You know, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, Sadducees, the chief priests, you know, they were plotting Jesus' death because they were fired up, you know, because, I mean, you know, this twit from Nazareth <laughs> came in here and showed us up. Yeah. You see the envy there? Yeah. So now it's their turn. Mm -hmm. Here's the first stroke. Verse 15, go. Then the Pharisees went and conspired together, plotting how to trap him by distorting what he said. So their questions were a ruse. Mm -hmm. They had already rejected him. They had already said he's not the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But we're going to test him. Mm -hmm. So 
so they can have something to accuse him mm-hmm. of. And we because they already yeah. plotted to kill him. Yeah, we're going to destroy what he's saying. So he okay. Jesus is our is our is our leader. He's our teacher. He's the head of our. He's the Lord of our lives. Okay. He says to us that the students are not going to get any better treatment than the teacher does. Right? That's 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 my paraphrase. In other words, what they did to the teacher, they will do to the students who follow after the teacher. We're disciples, right? So, if the person who 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 disciples us, his words are going to be distorted. So will ours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. While you're out proclaiming the truth of the gospel, proclaiming the reality of who Jesus is, proclaiming that we've been made righteous by the by the blood of the Lamb, people will come along and say, "Oh, so you think you're better than us?" Did I say that? No. But they're going to distort what you say because of their envy. Just like they did with Jesus. All Jesus is trying to get people to do is to put on their robes of righteousness and follow after the Father. So they can enter into the marriage feast. And, and, And they come along and say, well, I got my own clothes. I don't need to wear your clothes. Well, yeah, you do. Because your righteousness is as filthy rags. They don't want to go down that narrow road. They don't want to acknowledge, I have need of a Savior. I am a sinner. I have need of a Savior. And his name is Jesus. And I submit myself to him. I surrender. Uh oh, uh oh, I surrender. Uh, I'm guilty. And so they walk around in their own clothes and they don't get into the marriage feast of that. Thank you. Now, all of this dialogue happened on a single day okay. in the temple area here. And uh, we got that on hold as well. Start verse 16. at verse 16. Okay. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and that you teach the way of God truthfully without concerning yourself about what anyone thinks or says of your teaching. For you are impartial and do not seek anyone's favor, and you treat all people alike, regardless of status. All right, now, now, wait, don't go any further, please. Okay, now, who who is doing this talking? The Pharisees. The disciples of the Pharisees. Yes. The disciples right. of the Pharisees, along with... Well, the Pharisees, the Pharisees sent their disciples mm-hmm. to him. There you go. So these were the... You know, the disciples this, of the uh, right. All right, now, now, Jesus had his disciples. The Pharisees had their disciples, mm-hmm. and so the disciples of the Pharisees said to Jesus, mm-hmm. Teacher. along with the Herodians. Mm-hmm. The Herodians would be Herod Antipas. Mm-hmm. They said, yeah. "Teacher, yeah. we know." That you are sincere. Okay. So, so, so what are butter they? What, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me rub some butter on Jesus. Okay? Ah, yeah. We know that you are sincere and that you teach the way of God truthfully without concerning it. In other words, you don't care. You're teaching, you don't care what people think about you when you're teaching. Okay. For you are impartial and do not seek anyone's favor, and you treat all people alike, regardless of status. Okay, now here's the thing. Did they? 
Did the Pharisees do that? No. Come on in and sit in our favorite seats. Get out of the way, bum. Sit in the back on the ground. They were highly partial to the people who came to the temple. Just saying. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it permissible, according to Jewish law and tradition, to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Mm. Shut up. Listen up. Listen up. But Jesus, <laughs> aware of their malice. What's malice? Can you look up the word malice for me, husband? You mean from Webster's? Webster's, 1828 version. What is malice? There you go. Okay. Uh, malice. M-A-L-I-C-E. Malice is a noun. Mm -hmm. And it says... Uh, well, actually, um, it says it's a noun, and it says it's a verb transitive. Mm -hmm. uh, as a verb transitive, it means to regard with extreme ill will. To regard with extreme ill will. As a noun, it's extreme enmity of heart or malevolence, a disposition to injure others without cause from mere personal gratification or from a spirit of revenge. So he knew that these dudes was plotting against him. So, the, but, And this was revenge mm -hmm. for Jesus basically uh, from before. Uh, giving them them parables mm -hmm. and showing them their true who they really were. Selves, mm -hmm. you know? So they, they're revengeful in this here. Right. And Jesus was aware of it. Right. Verse 18, but Jesus, aware of their malice, asked, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? All right, hypocrites. Another one of our, our, our words we're going we to go over again. Now, uh, hypocrites. Jesus knew they were hypocrites. Mm -hmm. And uh, just in case you're wondering what the, you know, a hypocrite is. Uh, hypocrite is a play actor. We'll let our friend uh, uh, Webster uh, do this. Uh, uh, hypocrite. It says here a hypocrite uh, is a noun. Mm hmm. A hypocrite is one who feigns to be what he is not. One who feigns to be feigns, what he is not. Feigns means pretend. Yeah, he's a pretender. He's a pretender. One who has a form of godliness without the power. Now that's the religious leaders all day long. They had the garb. They had the look. You got that look? Must have took <laughs> a whole hour to put on them. The religious guards. clothes, <laughs> baby, bad, you know, right? And so he says here, uh, uh, one who is, let me see, hypocrite now, one who feigns to be what he is not, one who has the form of godliness without the power, or who assumes an appearance of piety and virtue when he is destitute of true religion. These religious leaders, they looked the part that they had zero fruit in their lives. And Jesus they said... No, they had no power with God. Yeah, no power of God, nor did they, they have any authority with God. And Jesus said, because you reject me, you're going to experience the destruction of your city and temple. There you are. Okay, so... um, Why are you testing me, you right, hypocrites? Right. Show me the coin. Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius, which is a day's wage. And Jesus said to them, 
whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, the Emperor Tiberius Caesar's. Then he said to them, then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were caught off guard, and they left him and went away. And now why were they caught off guard? They were caught off guard because they were testing Jesus in terms of the same way Jesus uh, treated them when he said, I'm going to answer you a question about my authority. If you answer my mm -hmm. question about John, the uh, Baptist there. What was the, what was the question? The question? Tell was, us then. What do you think? Is it permissible, according to Jewish law and tradition, to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, asked, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. Now, what things are Caesar's? The things based on the law of Caesar. Pay it to Caesar. Don't pay it to God. You can't pay God what belongs to Caesar. What belongs to God? Give God what belongs to God. I know, I'm touching your stuff. I'm touching all your stuff. So this was our Savior's answer. This was his answer. God's not after your 10%. He's after your heart. Yeah, I'll let that sink in. He's after your heart. We would rather give God 10% of what belongs to Caesar than 100% of our hearts. Yeah. Marinate in that for about six months. Change your mind. More marriage. All right, so the next one, verse 23, go. On that day, some Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection of the dead, came to him and asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies, leaving no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his widow and raise children for his brother. Now there are, were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. And the second also died childless. And the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. So in the resurrection, which they don't believe in, see that? So they're trying to test Jesus, what they're trying to do. They're trying to test him. Whose <laughs> wife of the seven will she be? For they all have married her. And notice the phrase that they use. The resurrection singular. Read in that verse. 29? 29, yeah. But Jesus replied to them, you are all wrong because you know neither the scriptures which teach the resurrection nor the power of God for he is able to raise the dead. Yeah. Now, do you see the phraseology here? They got it right. These, uh, 
individuals who give us this uh, Make It Loud Bible here. You see that bracket where it says, which teach the resurrection? The teaching on the resurrection is one of the fundamentals of the faith. And uh, our Jesus is going to be talking about it right here. Keep going, verse 30. We're in the resurrection. See, the first, see, see that language? The yeah. resurrection. For in the resurrection, neither do men marry, nor are women given in marriage. But they are like angels in heaven who do not marry nor produce children. Stop. You know, part of the marriage vow is till death do us part. That means after death, we are parted. In the resurrection, I'm not going to be married to him. No, we're not going to be friends with benefit either. Think that through. So for those of you who think that once I'm married, I'm going to be married until death and then after death. It's not in scripture. Not in scripture. Not in scripture. Verse 31. But as to the resurrection of the dead. Stop. There it is again. The resurrection. Not two, three, four. But as to the resurrection of the dead, have you not read in the scripture what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Now, when the Pharisees heard that, when, now, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced or muzzled the Sadducees, they gathered together. Mm -hmm. One of them, a lawyer, an expert in Mosaic law, Here we go. asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, unselfishly seek the best or highest good for others. The whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. What depends on these two commandments? The whole law. What was the law? All those books that Moses wrote? The first five yeah, books? Yeah, first five them? books is the, the law. Mm -hmm. I depended on these two commandments. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the whole law and the prophets depends on. What do we depend on since we're not under the law? Very. Very. Because we... We keep talking like we're under a law. 
We keep teaching the Bible like we're under the law of Moses. We're not under the law of Moses. Our high priest is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the high priest and king of God, who is on thy throne, O God, mm -hmm. is our high priest and king at the right hand of the Father. He carries the complete and total authority of Yahweh. So we're not under the law of Moses. Yeah. Never will be. Yeah, because he's never going to be coming off that throne. He's never going to be coming off In other words, he's going to have the complete and total authority of the Lord God. Watch this. For ever. All right, verse 41. All right. Now, while the Pharisees were still gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. All right, now, now, now. Take your time with this. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus gave the religious leaders three parables. Mm -hmm. The religious leaders gave Jesus three questions. And in both of the both of these dialogue expressions, mm -hmm. um, it became evident to the religious leaders mm -hmm. that they could not twist Jesus in his talk. Mm -hmm. And it also became evident to them that because they had rejected the King Jesus, mm -hmm. they were going to experience judgment. So now what Jesus is going to be sharing here is going to get them to see that they have rejected him. Okay. Go. Verse 42. What do you Pharisees think of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. All right. Now, Jesus asked them, how is it then that David, by the inspiration of the Spirit, called him Lord, saying, the Lord, the Father, said to my Lord, the Son, the Messiah, Sit my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Okay. So then if David called him, the son, the Messiah, Lord, how is he David's son? All right, now, don't, don't bypass this. Jesus was David's son, but the Pharisee, did not acknowledge Jesus as Yahweh. The Messiah. Yeah. See, Jesus, the Messiah, means Jesus, the anointed ruler of Israel. His rulership was not temporal, it was spiritual. Mm -hmm. And to receive his kingdom rule required acknowledgement of Jesus as Yahweh God in the flesh. And that's what you have down here in this quote in verse 44. It comes from Psalm 110. The, um, the scriptures in Psalm 110 are some of the most quoted verses in the entirety of the New Testament. They speak to the fact that a man, Jesus, is the supreme ruler of the universe. And so what Jesus was basically saying to uh, the Pharisees is, yeah, yeah, You say, I'm David's son, but the Old Testament is 
already said, I am almighty God. Read on and out. And therefore, we have verse 46. No one was able to say a word to him in answer. Nor from that day on did anyone dare to question him again. I mean, what because, could a religious leader say? Because when it comes down to brass tacks, okay, David called, if David calls him, the son, the Messiah, Lord, how is he David's son? He would have to be older than David. Mm -hmm. So it speaks to deity. That's the point Jesus is making. I am God. You all don't accept me as God. Mm -hmm. You all don't receive me as God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're going to experience God's judgment because if you say that I am, uh, if you say that I am not he who was from the beginning, you're going to die in your sins. The, these are the people in the, in the parable we just, the, the last parable we read, where he said, it's the marriage feast. You guys were previously called. There's going to be a marriage feast. And then they were told, now's the time for the marriage feast. Come on. And they said, no. We don't want We're going to disregard it. We don't like your son. We don't like we don't like him. And so we're not coming. And so we're going to burn your city down. The king had the city burned down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then the king sent out his servants to the highways outside the city. And began to call all kinds of people. Well, I'm one of those people that he called. Mm -mm. He's one of those people mm -mm. that he called. Mm -mm. Not just us. He's calling everybody. everybody. Come, come to the marriage feast of the Lamb, of the Father. He was calling out to the Lamb. Come, come, Earth. come. Put on God's righteousness and partake of this, this feast. Don't show up at the feast not wearing the clothes provided. You're going to be tied up. You, you thrown gonna, into you, out of You're going to be thrown out of that dinner. And you don't have to be. You just have to submit and put on the garment of righteousness that's been provided. It's that simple. Will you do it? Will you do it is the issue. What is your will? What will you do with Jesus? With Jesus. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the beginning and the end. Jesus is the first and the last. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the great shepherd. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is almighty God in the flesh. He is the word made flesh. So we, 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 we read here about, you know, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and, and, and mind. Okay? Love, second part is just as it's equal to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? That's the whole law. The whole of law, the whole law rests on these two commandments. Jesus is coming. What does our righteousness rest on? Because they couldn't be righteous in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus had to come. The, the, under the old law, the old, the old covenant, you couldn't be made righteous. You could be covered. 
but you couldn't be made righteous. We needed righteousness. It's the only way into the party. Yeah. We want to be in the party of the Lamb that has already suffered our sins. We want it. So the only way to receive righteousness from God is to surrender to God. Not be a good person. Throw that away. It's a waste of time. You can't do it. That's the law. We're going back to the law and then we're going back to works. You can't be righteous by your works. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gift of God is eternal life through Faith in Jesus Christ. So that, that's how you get righteous. Faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Do you believe in the finished work of Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection? And if thou shalt confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes in the righteousness with the mouth confession, confession is made. made. Unto salvation, for the scripture says, Whosoever should believe on him shall not be made ashamed. There is no shame. There's no shame. Not in God. Amen. Amen. Jesus is our righteousness. He is made unto us righteousness, sanctification, wisdom, and redemption. Because the scripture says, he that boasteth, let him boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we do. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Amen. here we are. We're going to partake of our communion um, now. We're going to 1 Corinthians 11.23. And as we go to 1 Corinthians 11.23, we are going to remember that... The things that we just read would be absolutely impossible to do if we were not made righteous. And we are. We are. We have surrendered our unrighteousness <laughs> for his righteousness by believing that Jesus is the son of the living God. That he is the son of David, who David called Lord. He is the Messiah. And he has exchanged my sin for his righteousness. And I put on those clothes gladly. I wear them proudly in godly, in godly understanding that this is the will of God that I walk in his holiness and in his righteousness. God willed it. I didn't will it. I didn't know what to will. I didn't know it was possible. But it is the will of God. Henceforth, he sent his son to do all this so that everybody that receives the son receives the righteousness and the ability to go before God without shame, without fear, without retribution, without judgment. Boldly. To boldly go <laughs> before the throne of God. Oh, or to go boldly before the throne of God. Here we go. You like your dangling participles? Yeah. <laughs> And you're splitting, splitting your infinitives. Hey. Um, but God wanted this. This was his plan. Before man ever sinned against God, God made a plan. And his plan was to send his only begotten son to take our place for the sin we were going to commit. It's 
spend some time on that and give you a headache. But this is when you serve a God who knows the end from the beginning. That's who is the God of all we can perceive of with these eyes and think of with these brains. From the from the largest thing you can conceive down to the smallest thing that we can conceive, God is in the midst of it. From measuring out the oceans with his or measuring out the heavens with his hand. You gotta read the Old Testament. You understand the 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 complexities of who God is and the minutia in his creation, the detail in how he laid out everything, how everything's connected and is I'm not that smart to even explain it. I just know that it is. And people who are much smarter than me and may not even be Christians. You don't have to be a Christian to recognize the awesome intellect it takes to conceive of this universe. Why the oceans don't just overwhelm the entire world when it feels like it. There's limits. And there's repair. And it's all in God's creative hand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. First Corinthians eleven twenty three. This is uh, Paul writing to his uh, converts in Corinth and letting them know that there's some things they need to correct. And that they are, um, you know, they need to get back in line. Because this communion is not just, you know, uh, a pre-meal kind of a thing. No, this is, this is sovereign. This is necessary for you to understand that all the work, all the, all the, all the things that were laid out throughout time culminate in this meal. All this stuff that was done from the garden forward come together and Jesus sacrificing himself for us. The atoning propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus single most important event in history. In history. For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread whatever you got at the house bread Cheerios Pop-Tarts potato chips Whatever you got at the house. Yeah. See, when I say whatever, I mean whatever. I, trust me, I think I told you I, I've done this with cheese twists and orange juice. Use whatever at the house. Because this is an act of your heart. This is an act of your heart. Where is your heart in this meal? He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This bread represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you in your stead, in your place. Instead of you, it's going to be me. You're guilty, but I'm taking the blame. We were guilty. He took the blame. D. 
do this in affectionate remembrance. In other words, when we do this, be thankful. Be appreciative. Be treated as an honorable thing that he would substitute himself for us all. Okay? Look at it. Thank you, Lord. Do it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the same way. After supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. New covenant. New covenant. Old covenant, love the Lord with your heart, your heart, mind, soul, your neighbor as yourself. That's old covenant. It's good. It's just. Don't make it right. We need it right. We need it righteousness. That's the only way into the dinner is with righteousness on. And the, the clothing of righteousness, who's the other righteousness? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. This blood is Jesus. This lets us know that the blood he shed cleanses us completely. Nothing missing. Nothing not cleansed by this blood. Nothing not washed away by this blood. This blood is complete. One time. For all time. No more blood needs to be shed. No more sacrifices need to be made. No more temples need to be built. Wow. That's a good one right there. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he built it's his body of Christ. Know you not that you are the temple of God. That's what Paul wrote. First Corinthians. Try to tell you. Yeah. This cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood, in my blood, ratified and established in my blood. Ratified and established in my blood. Nothing else. No building can do it. No religious order can do it. No new sets of doctrines or the blood. The blood. His blood alone. It's incorruptible. Hallelujah. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. Drink it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, Precious is the flood that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So every time you eat this bread and drink this cup. Oh, my God. Yeah. You show forth. You show forth. Symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death. Until, Until he, comes he comes again. again.
Is he coming again? He's coming again. He's coming again. Because. Because he came the first time. He came the first time. He's coming again. He's coming the second time. He promised to return. You know, we got a brother, Brother Milo McFevin, and Broken Heart. He got this song. He is coming back again. He's coming back again. I know. He's coming back, coming back again. It might be morning, not a noon. I know he's coming soon. I know. He's coming back again. Be ready. Saints, stay ready. Friends, put on that garment of righteousness. It's your only way into the party. You know, I think they have these things called, they have like white parties and they have black parties. No, you got to wear a certain color clothes. God got a party. He's going to play. And you got to wear that garment of righteousness or you don't get in. You got to put that garment on. And he's provided it for us. And he's provided for us with the price paid. It's the blood of Jesus. He paid it with his blood. He paid it in full. You don't owe anything. But here's the, here's the kicker. When you put on that robe of righteousness, this is what happened. Let me tell you what happened. It changes who it changes you on the inside. So when you get changed on the inside, guess what happens? It starts changing you on the outside. You start desiring different stuff when you get changed on the inside. You start wanting to be a better you. And the only way you can be the better you is how? In Christ Jesus. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Always do. Always will. Um, know this. You can catch all these teachings at Hastings Bible Fellowship on Facebook and on YouTube. Hastings Bible Fellowship. Hastings Bible Fellowship. Like it, share it, subscribe, and then share it some more. Because what do you do to share? I think you guys are being stingy. Uh -oh. I'm, just, I'm, throw, I'm throwing it out there. I'm throwing down. I think you're being stingy and you're not sharing. You're not sharing. As my husband says, that's what he says. Share, share, share these teachings with others. It's your part of going ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It's part of you still responsible for what you do, but you share these and get and help get this word out here. Get people in the kingdom. Get people clothed in God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants. Mm -hmm. He don't want her to throw nobody out. He wants his house full of people with his righteousness on. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. All right. And you can also catch these teachings, snippets of these teachings, over on Instagram under Hastings Bible. Hastings Bible, little snippets of our teachings. And guess what? Share those too. Just share. It's a button. And then you click on the people you want to share it to. Just do your whole list. Just, just click them all. Share. We love you. We appreciate you. We really, really do. We are thankful for you giving us your donations of time for these teachings. You don't have to, but you do. And we appreciate your giving to us. Remember, God don't want your 10%. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. We love you. Till next time, remember, be your best self. And how you do that, as we said, in Christ Jesus. Love you. Love you.